And Wait we're live. Wait we're done. Wait till we're done. But the deal is, it's not that. I'm just going to lay out the truth for some things. Here's the deal. I hate my brother. This week and next week, at least the East week and next week, so there's at least part seven for, for real. Hmm? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, they was talking to Tim last night. He was doing. He's, he behaved, so we will get it, Tim. You I ain't talking to nobody about. I don't know if you've been behaving. So. Never. Never. I got you. <laughs> the next, the next two weeks, I'm gonna convey. I'm gonna try to convey why I think it's credible that we learn to worship in spirit and in truth. Now we've talked about it. We have tried to show it. We've come to it. People have responded. The feedback one-on-one -on -one with people has been absolutely amazing. But in the other breath, I'm like, man, how do I get the rest of us there? Or how do you get, you remember I said, sometimes you get people in the basket, you're trying to get more in, or we're all in together, and some hop out, and it's like jumping beans. Hurting hands. Yeah. So the thing is, 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 is we're on this journey together, right? And that's the way I, that's the way I look at it. And... And I've always said that, and I'm actually going to put it in writing, and I actually got the right wording in the gym this morning, and, and then by the time I got to the bathroom where I could actually put it in my phone, <laughs> what was I thinking? And then I took me about 10 minutes, oh, I got it back. <laughs> got the right wording. It, but anyway, here's the deal. It is critical that we learn to worship, which means live, function, the way we interact with each other, the way we interact with the world, the way God can use us. In the spirit, it, 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 it's unbelievable what God can do. But you got to be able to look at that situation and see God. If I can't get you to see God in your own life, and that's why I do teach the way I teach it. So I want you to see God in your situation. Good, bad, ugly, God's in it. The situation with this family that we prayed over this morning, God's in it. And like Robert said, it, actually there's, there's several times our pastor has taught, and we know this, that people are more open to God. One, when you're changing jobs. <coughs> Two, when you're moving. Three, is the death of the family. Well, not the child. But you you know, you're hurt, you're angry with God, but you're in that cycle, but you're open to the Holy Spirit. You're open to that the person will speak the right words and do the right things. God will work with the Spirit. So with that being said, uh, what is the Spirit and truth thing? If you haven't been with us, John 4, 23, 24, Mary Ann, help me out, sister. Yeah, the time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And by the way, this is what um, um, Alyssa was talking about. Well, that, oh, that lip thing, that's a, I'm Baptist. This is, you know, it's not about methods, it's not about Baptist, it's not on that mountain or that mountain in that setting or that setting. The spirit is real in all settings. I don't care if you're at work and the old people are driving you crazy. Worship the Spirit of truth. And where are we going to worship God in the middle of that? Oh, yeah. How you live, how you act, how you respond. That is. Anyway, with that being said, there is a perspective on the truth that I want to give you this morning. And it's from, a, from the uh, author of film named <coughs> Dinesh D'Souza. Some of y'all know who he is. Some of you just really like him, really respect him. Some people don't like him at all. Now, he's talking in a political term, but I'm looking at it in a spiritual context. But uh, watch this. Uh, Listen to this. Okay, the question is, uh, how do you talk to someone today about politics without increasing polarization? Well, the first thing I would do is, I think there is a way to do it. But I would remove the without increasing polarization clause because uh, the moment you start putting binders on yourself uh, and say, I don't want this, I don't want that, it's going to weaken your ability to make progress. Let me put it this way. If I say to you, everything that you just told me is completely false, and you then feel like punching me, I will have increased polarization, right? That doesn't really worry me. I'm not concerned about increasing or decreasing polarization. That's not our problem. Our problem is that we have too much polarization or too little polarization. Our problem is that we have too little truth. Amen. We have too little knowledge of real history. Uh, we have too little... So, sometimes you have to increase polarization to restore civility. The last part, 
sometimes you got to face the facts and you have a heated argument and fight with the devil and fight with, you know, you, you can't change something unless you face it. That's not my point of this. He said, one problem uh, is we have too little truth. And I'll say this, in the church we have too little truth. Because we're bringing our political truth, our family truth, and what grandma taught, what we heard, what our friends, what we read on Facebook. We bring that truth in here like it's God's truth. That ain't God's truth, Jack. And you come in here with attitudes, and I come here with attitudes, and all. Oh, no, no, no. We have too little truth, and we have too little spirit. And, and we have uh, too uh, little knowledge of history, biblical history, biblical truth. Because if you understand biblical history, I understand biblical history. Everything we're seeing today in our world, in our family, in your marriage, and what's happening in the world, in our country, is nothing new. It is all right there. And you got Christians on one side of an issue here, and they are in the spirit. And they say, and they say they're in the spirit. Who's in the spirit? Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. And until you face things, which is what I love to do here, which is why I'm gonna get upset and leave. But i got to make sure I'm not driven by either. If you have a family and you see your mom and dad's body, you, you can't, it's not that you take sides. you got to be the mediator, the peacemaker, but you gotta, you got to have a basis on what's right and wrong, and that is truth. It's just too little truth. We fight over what isn't real in our lives. We fight over in church what isn't even real. Who cares about the fellow? Who cares whether you started on time or whatever? Now, some people can't get over that. But at the end of the day, I says, what you do for me, in truth and in the spirit, what you've done to glorify God when our lives are over, is that's going to matter. Now, that being said, um, this polarization thing. What is polarization? I lost my clicker for Okay. So, polarization. A sharp division. As a, by the way, this is a political sermon, but it's going to get good. Uh, a political uh, a population or group into opposing factions. That's polarization. We have one in this group and one in this group, and they don't like each other. And here's a perfect example: Listen versus U.S. Tigers <laughs> <laughs> and Gamecocks. Polar. One. Polar extreme and the other, the polar extreme. And you get what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Easy way to kind of lay that out there. But here's here's the interesting thing: is this week we I have, and maybe you have. I know the country has dealt with a lot of this polarization. Where people got opinions on one extreme, people got opinions on another extreme. Whether it's political, in your work, at your in your life, in your marriage, you know. Uh, you want fuzzy slippers, and he does. I mean, I don't know. But here's the deal. Still fine. From a from a Christian perspective, about being in the spirit and in the truth from the verse, what people think and believe is the spirit. Two Christians can be on two extremes. Okay, what people think and believe is the truth. We could be on two extremes, and sometimes we can both be right. Sometimes we can both be wrong. We're going with this. Polarization. Alright. I don't know exactly how to put this in the right context, but I'm going to just say it. To be a Christian that actually and truly is a Christian in spirit and truth. Not in what you say and do and act, but in who and what you are inside of them, okay? That means that the Christians, you will find yourself on the polar opposite of the Christians sitting beside you, the one in front of you, and the one behind you. And a lot of times, it's not that, you know, it was like this at the gym, they're doing all the right things, doing all the right reasons, oh, and, and then the Christians are taking offense to that with each other. Because one's fighting for tradition, and one's like, well, this is God's word. If you are true in your spirit, if you are true in the truth, you're going to find yourself not on the polar opposite of the unsaved, but the Christian beside you. And, 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 if, you, and if you're a Christian, whether a good one or a bad one, you're going to find that the world is completely different than you too anyway. You're on polar opposites. They're not going to get you. 
but I don't always understand you. And I had a, a guy tell me yesterday, he says, I, I, I did this stuff, they're doing it right, and people don't like it, and they're attacking I don't get it. That's because they don't like the spirit in you. That's because their spirit, their mindset, their flesh is going to fight everything that is pure and real and true inside of you. Expect if you're going to be the real thing that people aren't going to understand you. They're going to understand your heart, they're going to understand your motive, they're going to understand what you believe. Now, to be a Christian that unequivocally lives and functions in God's truth, now you have a dilemma. Because there's Christians that change the truth to meet their needs. They know God said, God said, marriage is a man and a woman. But our society has said, you know what? Man, it can be man and man, woman and woman, man and dog, you know, I don't know. It can be whatever you want it to be. Right? That's not what God's word said. So be a Christian that unequivocally stands for the word of God. You're going to make enemies inside the church because a lot of people are changing the word of God. They, it isn't what God said. Well, I know what the word, how, many, how many people have heard? I've heard this too many times around here. And I've been guilty of it myself. Well, the word of God said this, but I believe this. What did God do this, but I see? You're going to find yourself in arguments with other Christians. Let them all the world. You guys get me? Now, uh, this new buddy of mine, he's dead, but uh, Mr. Raven, he'll use a quote like Only people who want to change the gospel, the word of God, are those who are truly unchanged, who are, <laughs> who are unchanged by it. So here's the deal. Inside of you is this drive to change things. Okay? And it comes with being born. When people want to change the word of God, change it isn't because they don't want, they don't want to let the truth change them. So you've got to justify, rationalize. You get it? Dude, this dude, I like this dude. This dude and I, I mean, I, uh, I, 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 I can understand where he's coming from. Because this is what I deal with. Well, Joe, I know you preach this, so I know the Bible says this, but I disagree with you and you're wrong. When I get in here, I've got to show you the word of God in the truth. And if we are giving your opinion, no, I'm telling you, I can't come in and always give you my, I got to give you this. This is everything as it's done through the lens of God, through the lens of the truth. And, but here, but here's, here, here's, the, here's the issue, is the Bible says, and you will pray to me, and I will come to you, and I will heal you. Is that not the truth? That's what it says, right? If you believe in me, I will forgive you of your sins, and you will have eternal life. Is that true? Until you don't feel worthy of it. Until you don't want to let go of it. Have you not just changed the word of God because you don't want to let go of it? Now, you didn't say it, but you're living it differently. And you're it differently. Why is it that the Christians who say they believe the word of God won't live it? You changed the word of God. Because you don't believe it. Or you won't live it. Or you won't accept it. Jesus said, the one who's free is free indeed, right? He's not going to say, okay, well, every, this half room can be free indeed. And this half can. No, no, no. His promises are for us. Why are some Christians free and others aren't? Only people who want to change the gospel are those who are unchanged by it. And a lot of times it isn't that God isn't giving us mercy, grace, healing. It's in our own spirit. We don't want to accept it. Now this guy, uh, Mr. Uh, Raven, knew I like him. He has some other good little quotes. He says, uh, the only reason we don't have revival is because we are willing to live, we are willing to live without it. I'm willing to go through my life. I'm going to keep going to church and hating my life, hating my relationship, hating myself. Live with it. We're Staying in a marriage is nothing but a fight, and we get better to fight. We get better to fight. We heal to destroy. That's what a typical Christian does. We're willing to live without. I mean, we can live without true healing, true peace, true revival. Dude's right. Today's church wants to be raptured for responsibility. That's what bothers me with Christian. Christian talk to me about the rapture. You know why he wants that? 
actually don't have to face the hard times. No, no, when is a Christian going to say, I want to be rational because I want to be with Jesus? We want to escape with our responsibility. Now, either the Protestants are right, or one half of the Protestants are right, or the Catholics are right. Either there's going to be a rapture in the beginning, in the middle, or the end, or the rain. Or it's already happened, according to some people. But anyway, not here to argue that. But the point is, uh, you know, what happens if you're wrong? And it isn't a pre-rapture. We've got to go through some things. So, hey, hope for the best. Right for the worst. Be who God wants you to be. Live for God. Live in the Spirit. Change the world. And who? You know what it matters? It really doesn't matter when he comes, does it? <laughs> He's coming. This morning. A lot of people uh, change. Hey, I don't have to get to that. Uh, okay. I love this guy. He says, <laughs> are the things you are living for worth Christ dying for? You living for that sin? You living for that dysfunctional behavior in your personality? With maybe you're, maybe it's uh, your, maybe it's girls, or maybe it's pornography, maybe it's men, maybe it's drugs. It, are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for? You know, I like the way this guy thinks. I think like him. It's scary. My ambition in life is to be. On the devil's most wanted list. Yeah. I don't want to hide. I don't want to be in a closet. I want to be fighting. You destroyed my family growing up. You took my father. You took my mom. You, you, you destroyed me. Oh, by the way, I'm taking more with me than you took with me. That's right. That's right. And I don't care if you don't like. I don't care how much you attack me. I'm going to stand. You, look what God brought me through. There ain't nothing else that he can put me. And when I say that, I'm not, I'm not issuing God a challenge. I'm not tempting the devil. What I'm saying is, is going through what I went through, grew my faith. Mm -hmm. We were the poorest people in town, but somehow there was always a little something on the table every night. I don't know how that happened, except people showed up. I don't know how a kid who comes from my background stands in front of you this morning. It's all God. I won't, yeah, put me on your list, Ellen. If Jesus had preached, this is what I used about a month or two ago. If Jesus had preached the same messages that ministers, preachers were preaching today, he would never have been crucified. Right. And the reason preachers don't preach that way is they don't want to be the devil's most wanted list because they don't have to face trials, relations. Fight, maybe your church, maybe you lose your big church. Maybe you never get it. Maybe God's plan is different than your plan. Is there, you know, there's a way to preach that people think that you're deep and powerful, and and in the end, sometimes maybe you're not. I don't want to be in that boat. But the quote from last week, this is the quote I've had the most feedback on any quote ever gave you. This from last week. One of these days, some simple soul will pick up the book of God, read it and believe it, and then the rest of us will be embarrassed. Oh, I love it. Because I, I get some people, I heard you preach on that. You preached on that last year. You, you preached on that. I heard the preacher preach that. I read that in my Bible. Jesus don't care what you read in your Bible. By the way, go find a place where Jesus said, read your Bible. By the way, he does. Uh, but my, my point is this. What did you find a place where he said, go to church? No, he says, be the church. Be love. Be the transformation. Let God change you. Let God change your life so the power of the Spirit of God in you will change the world. Because there's a lot of people that know more Bible verses, that memorize more Bible verses, have been to more classes, have been to more conferences, and they have all this knowledge but zero power, zero authority. I want you to have power and authority. Over the devil, but influence is what I really want us to have in the world to change the world. <coughs> Polarization. I talked about this last week without having the word for it. John 14, John 14, this is just from last week. Verily I tell you, whoever believes in me, Jesus said, Whoever believes in me, Jesus says, 
will do the works I have been doing. Oh, you're saying if you believe in me, I can tell you believe in me. You know how I can tell you believe in me? Because you're going to love the unloved. You're going to heal the broken. You're going to invest in people who are less than you. You're going to give what I'm giving you in love, in spirit, in mercy, in grace, and forgiveness. You're going to live it. Gonna live it. And they, us, those of us who choose to, who say, you know, we believe in Jesus and who are doing what Jesus did, he says, you will do greater things. Oh, we love that, don't we? Oh, I hear that. I hear people quote that at the gym every other day. Oh, they're on fire from Sunday morning. They're on they're they're in the spirit. They need the power in the spirit. I had that conversation a couple times this week. <laughs> Jesus says, because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. New car, new house. I want a new husband. I want all my problems gone. I want a perfect life. I want this. I want that's not what. He, in context, he said, if you are doing what I'm doing, which is saving the world, healing the world, changing the world, if you're doing that, you ask, oh, I don't have a handle. I got to say, you could church this morning, and, and, and she's uh, in this love affair, this triangle, it's got 12 sides. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, this is this is an episode of a show. Days of our life. Days of our life. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry Springer. Which is all, yeah. Okay. Dude, dude, God, I don't know how to help this person. You know, they're married to, you know, three of her own brothers, you know? <laughs> so nine of them are outside the family, three of them are her own family, and Lord, how can I help him? Jesus, you know, Jesus, Jesus says, do what, I, do what I'm doing. Cast out the demons. Heal the broken. Love the unloved. Change the world. Spread the gospel. And whatever you ask in my name, I'll give you that wisdom. I'll give you that truth. I'll give you that spirit. I'll give you the ability to change your own life. By the way, that's where we got to start. We change our lives, we're just going to let you change somebody else's. Because here's the deal. When you give what you don't got, you may help them, but what good if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? There's a lot of passions, a lot of wounded healers in this world that are doing a great work for God because they're bringing people to God. Because you understand what they feel. You understand where they hurt. And the church is full of these people. But they've never healed is it something, ain't it a tragedy to be able to lead somebody to where they get freedom and healing and truth and a new life? But they think that you do. You understand it, but you haven't accepted it. You haven't let it change. You haven't let it heal you. You haven't let it transform you. So you get them there, and then they move on, but you're still up there, and you die there. Right. That is happening every day in churches. And a lot of us have slips of paper that says you're ordained. And we have titles. And we're leading big churches and little churches. We're leading ministries. I can deal with this type of polarization because this is the Christian that's making a difference. Most Christians making a difference is coming to church and hearing the pastor preach. That's not mine. It sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like the room. <laughs> you know, we 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 set out the church a little bit different, and some people want to run to it, some people want to run from it for different reasons. If I wouldn't face the things we face and talk about it the way I talk about it, we would have a larger crowd down the road. But here's the deal. I told we got to be a safe place for the broken, the hurting, the confused, the lost, the unbelievers, the believers, uh, the reject. I mean, we got to be a safe place for people. All right? But we got to be a dangerous place that when you come here, people are going to love you, invest in you, believe in you, pray for you, build you, and the Holy Spirit's going to grab you right from the first song to the end of the service. We got to change lives. That makes us dangerous. All right? And this is the kind of Christian that Jesus is talking about in John 14. One that's going to change the world. But here's the deal. Before, watch this. Now, remember this quote from a while ago? One of these days, some simple soul will pick up 
the book of God, read it, and believe it, and it's going to change them. It's going to give them power to change the world. So here's the question. Is that you? Listen. Oh, I want, air. I want everybody's attention because everybody's avoiding looking at me. You know, I know, you know why? Uh, I know when you're avoiding looking at me. Is that you? Is that me? Because I get up here and talk, you think, oh man, he's so bold. You know what preachers are good at? Talking. You know what you don't listen to? A used car salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all see the top 10 list of people you can't, the people that the world doesn't trust? Used car salesman's on there. <laughs> Lawyers are at the top of the list. I'm not sure what number, but it might be one. I don't know. I think they are. <laughs> okay. I mean, I ain't seen the list in several years now. Politicians. Politicians. And the pastor's in the top five. So if you're getting done with being a lawyer, you can be a pastor. you got all kind of turkey skin. I'll be stepping down the list. <laughs> hey, you're not doing it right, huh? There's that top five. There's a, and, uh oh, hit the wrong button. <laughs> and is that us as a church? Are, are we in the church that we, that more than just reading it on Sunday morning, man, this will come alive in us? And we're going to live it? Because most people are satisfied just, yeah, I read that cutesy story in the Bible about Noah. Yeah, and also read part when he was drunk. <laughs> and, and do you understand the context of what happened there and why God told? Don't have your story recorded in the Bible because the Bible will. Delicious. It tells the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yeah. I'm sure David wanted to be remembered as the great king, not as the adulterer, the bad father, and, and the murderer. Yeah. But here's the deal. Don't we real faith beats real life? That's our little motto, right? Okay. There is a little test that we can tell if we're on this list or not, if we can and uh, it's a close self check. Shelly, would you do that John 14, 15, 16. If you love me, keep my command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be. Oh, Christians, you know him, but some of us can't accept him even as Christians. Can we be honest? Because we know changes. So we change what married, we change gender, we change uh, and all those other things I don't want to talk about right now because they get me moved in the wrong direction. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. Remember what I told you? It's not a question of love. You remember that? It's not a question of love. I know you love Jesus, but Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. Keep my commands. Shelly, Mary Ann, Jeff, <laughs> Drew, Drew don't do nothing wrong because he don't leave his room except when Anna comes around. That's <laughs> It is a question of trust because if you love me, keep my commands. But it takes a lot of trust to walk away from your past. Let go of the hurt. Face the truth. Face the future. Let it change you. Admit the truth. It takes a lot of uh, it takes a lot. So here's the deal about, uh, I think I put it, uh, do you trust Jesus enough to, this is the question, to let your flesh die and live in the spirit? Wait, wait, there's two types of flesh. And I needed to communicate this. And I haven't done this very clearly because no preacher's ever preached it this way. And, and I've been preaching both sides of it. I think people are getting a little uh, bipolar from it. Okay? There's two flesh. There's the evil flesh that you want to do everything wrong. Okay? When well, you want to do everything wrong, sex, drugs. Drugs, rock and roll, you know, some of the things that we did in our past. But that's why the Bible says some, what some of you want work. The other thing in the flesh is when you are a Christian and you're in good communion with God, you're living good, you're doing all the right things, but everything you do is because you're supposed to. You got your checklist. Don't cuss, don't gossip, don't gamble, pray, read. You guys get me? Go to church. Lead a ministry? Be a pastor? I can do all those things and never be in the Spirit. I can do this from my flesh. But when I do that from my flesh, 
I walk up to somebody, somebody on the street, and I'll just say something to them. And they'll go, how do you know? I didn't know. I don't have ESP. It just happens. It happened last night. I'll tell you about that. It happened. I didn't know. I said something in a joking way. It was a joke. God came. Checklist. That's what I mean. There's two types of flesh. There's a Christian that's there's a person that's a Christian that's living in flesh because the flesh controls them. And there's people who don't know Jesus and they're in the flesh. And then there's Christians who, though we're Christian and we do it right, we're still. And I love talking to Leah yesterday because she's getting what I'm talking about. Even if she didn't know she was getting there. Now here's the deal. Do you trust Jesus enough to let your flesh die and live in the spirit? That means he shows you what you can't see. He shows you what you can't reason, process, understand. Hmm. And do you trust Jesus enough to let your version of the truth die and stand for his truth? There's a lot of churches going to hell in a handbasket. Denominations. And I hope and pray y'all keep me honest. And I'll keep y'all honest. Now, this was a terrible Heartbreaking. School shooting. Parkland, Florida. 17 students and school officials murdered. Anybody not know about that? If you just woke up, you ain't been no TV, no radio, no phone, no Facebook. It was a really tragedy. And that was a joke about the FBI. They were told about this multiple times, warned. And anyway, it, says that I give up Facebook because, man, she'd be on there fighting for the truth. Because, man, when that happened, you had the ones that were very sympathetic, and then you had the people who had an agenda and all that, and they come out of the wood. And you have this whole world fighting over a tragedy. It, it, it was just crazy. So everybody, every, seemed like every person organization, they believed that this person was responsible for what happened and this is possible. They're responsible. I mean, everybody's getting blamed for it. And there was, I mean, the hate happened on the campus, but there was more hate people talking about Evil, anger, hate, verbal attacks, threats of violence, people lying about what actually happened, people lying about the background of the person, manipulating this Things that support their agenda. Trump's responsible. The NRA is responsible. It's the li liberals. It, it, it's God's fault. It's the best one. And the justification I read most often, I didn't read much because I was sick of it. They said that there, the proof that there is, is no God is that God would allow that to happen. Do you know how many Christians were agreeing with that? <gasps> They're in their flesh. They don't get it. They don't see the truth. Hmm. Now, this, there's this uh, one lady. Her name is Kelly Rayleigh. Y'all know about her yet? Good. She is teach, She is the reigning 2017-2018 Teacher of the Year in the state of Florida. Overall Teacher of the Year. She is a either a 5th grade or 6th grade teacher. She's middle school. All right? She wrote a statement, and it's the best I've seen. And she prefaces it by this. You can see it on Facebook. Okay, I'll be the bad guy and say what no one else is brave enough to say but wants to say. I'll take all the criticism and attacks from everyone because you know what? I'm a teacher. I get attacked every day. <laughs> I'll be brave. I'll speak the truth. And she is reigning teacher of the year. She's I say, oh, she is. Oh, how, did, how does a person like her nowadays... Politically correct. <laughs> Somebody 
mean, it's something right down there because she has a platform. I guess as of this morning, 10 million people have read this. And it's been on, it was on the news, and some news were, were chastising her as the devil, and other news organizations were chastising her as a hero. I'll let you decide what I think. This is what she said. Until we as a country are willing to get serious and talk about mental health issues, lack of mental care for the mental health issues, lack of discipline in the home, horrendous lack of parental support when the schools are trying to control horrible behavior in school. Oh no, not my kid. What did you do to cause my kid to react that way? Well, well what did we do? You weren't a parent, that's why. We were reading the lines. You should get it. Uh, lack of moral values, and yes, I'll say it, violent video games that take away all sensitivity. How many people just walk up and kill that many people and not have any feelings? And then you just go to, and you, and you just go to McDonald's and eat a burger. Like nothing happened. You're completely desensitized. I don't know if video games desensitize them, but anyway, let's keep going. As well as reality TV that makes it commonplace for people to constantly scream up at each other's faces. <laughs> and not that any other person but themselves, we will have a gun problem in school. As long as this stuff is happening, that's why you're going to have a gun problem in school. No respect, no dignity, no authority, no... Oh, oh I love it. She gets, she gets a lot better, too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> our kids don't understand the permanency of death anymore. They have no aggressive reality. Oh, wait, she, she, she gets a lot deeper. My parents invaded my life. They knew where I was all the time. <laughs> they made me have a curfew. They made me respect their rules. They had full control of their house. And any time, could and would go through every inch of my bedroom, backpack, pockets, anything. Parents, it's time to step up. Be a parent that actually gives a crap. I'm glad you said it. Be a, the annoying mom <laughs> that pries and knows what your kid is doing. Yeah. Stop being their friend. They have enough friends at school. Be their parent. Be, be the cool mom <laughs> means not a damn thing when either of your kid is either dead or is killing other people. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, don't, 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 you can't say these things. You're offending people who are hearing this. Praise Jesus. This time will offend the truth. I was taught respect for human life, compassion, rules, common decency, and most of all, I was taught that if I move out, my life and they were going to know what was happening because they loved me and wanted the best for me. This post wasn't about gun control. This was about me loving the crap out of people and wanting the best for them. This was about my school babies, her students, and knowing that God created each of them for our greatness and just wanting them to actually basically I just wanted to reach their futures. Those 17 lives matter. When are we going to take our own responsibility seriously? Mm -hmm. That's teacher of the freaking universe. Mm -hmm. You won't believe the death threat she got. Now, her first point was about mental illness. Why was she talking about that? The kid, look at his history. They, 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 but here's what we learned from, uh, I love you, have fun at work. Not care, it's going nothing. <laughs> yeah. uh, Catherine's friend that came, that came to church with her, uh, what was her name, uh, Alicia? Their studies, mental health, 85% of the mental health problems in Spartanburg County are not being met. 85%. But here's the deal. Everybody know what NA is? Anybody want to know what AA is? Yeah, we do, don't there's also like celebrity recovery. You know who that's for? That's for the person who has a drug problem, a drinking problem. Okay? That person, that person is getting counseling. You know who's not getting counseling? Their children. <coughs> their spouse. And they're trying to find their way through life with their now the percent that's not getting healed and that's why the kids are going to school and that's why the kids are out of control because nobody's investing in them yes, 
I had a teenager, and I shared a little bit last week. I had a teenager tell me she was brought up on stage at her church to say something good about the youth pastor. And she was honest. She goes, you do really good lessons, but you don't know me, and I don't know you. Preachers think we can preach a sermon, or you pastors think we can preach a sermon, and, and, and ministry leaders think they can just put on their show and do their thing. Like me and Lee were talking yesterday. Once you shoot people, you got to build a relationship. You've got to invest. You've got to mentor. You've got to be there. You've got to give answers. And, and, and that person in front of you, that is, you not only are you changing that person's life, but if you're putting the right things in them, you're changing their faith. How does the church heal? The church is supposed to be in that 85% gap, but we're not. Because we're too much. And we're too busy going home. Even though we go to church and then you know we know the truth, we're still living in our anger, our past, our hurt, our brokenness. And we won't heal. It isn't that Christ can't heal. It isn't that he doesn't want to heal. It isn't that he doesn't want you to be free. It is you that don't want to be free. It is you that don't want to heal. It is you that don't want to face the truth. And that's the truth. It is. How many times can I preach the same sermon on forgiveness? Do you forgive yourself? How many times can I preach on freedom before you let your how many times can I preach sermon to step out and change the world before somebody actually steps out and actually shows up instead of Shelly being the only one in the rain, in the cold? <coughs> it would help if my text message went out there, right? <laughs> when you ruined anything, get it. I knew I was in trouble. He's not messenger. Right. Where am I going with this sermon? I'm getting myself in trouble. So here's the deal. You ready for this? I'm getting myself in a lot of trouble. I hope you're going to love me when I'm done. Now, since everybody wants to figure out who's to blame, that's the question. Who was to blame for what happened in Parkland, Florida? But nobody asked me. But say if you come to me and go, hey, Jim, who's to blame? I got the answer. Have you figured it out? You and I. Oh, let me go a little deeper. Especially the older generations. You ready to go even deeper? More specifically, the church Christian in the pulpit. It's our fault. I hope by the time I'm done with this, you'll get where I'm going. Now, that being said, um, why do I say that? Joe, why do you say that? I'm glad you asked. You know, nobody asked. <laughs> you got to look deeper to see the deep truth. Everybody hears the truth. Jesus said, blah, 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 blah. Well, you got the truth, but did you get the deeper truth? Did you get the lie? Yeah, that's my buddy right there. Dude, I can see the part that's you, the part that's this day. Huh? I can see the part that's you. That loving, that you see. That's dead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see how you win on one another? Now, when dad comes in, you want to do it, dad? Dad, I can see the part that's you. That sweet, little young man. <coughs> Woo, all that howling that. <laughs> then I make them. They're both my friend now. That's us preachers, and you know, we just ourselves when we do that. <laughs> Why do I say that it's us? We look we, to see the answer. We look beyond what we can see in our own reasoning and understanding. Okay, you got to see the cause and effect that is in your life. Yes, I feel like the teacher. 
And this is where uh, I may ruffle a few feathers, but I don't care. I do care. But you can't the truth. There is a progressive movement in the USA. And I already said they're not to blame. I'm saying we're to blame. All of their cries was about gun control. Gun control to control the evil, the darkness that's in the hearts of men. Can you ever legislate? I get, I get. But here's the deal. The problem they never take guns away from to fix a problem, well, the problem they want to fix is the problem that their mindset created. Now, how did they create that? Watch this. What political movement in America took God and prayer out of school? What political movement has taken God out of the Democratic Party? What political movement is trying to take God out of our schools, our marketplace, you can't say God, you can't have a Bible, you can't pray. Watch this. What political party has the mindset that said if you discipline your child, it's abuse? So you don't discipline, you don't give a rules, you don't say no. What political party, political movement, I'd rather say, because they really necessarily party because you can go to either side and we play this game, has taken pride, honor, and respect out of the heart and mindset of the nation. Okay, and that's something that made us great and replaced it with vision, hate, violence, resistance to authority, resistance to the law. Go ahead, fill in the blank. They successfully, this movement successfully replaced truth. God's truth, God's values, God's morals, but relative truth, relative morals. What does that mean? God says killing is evil. Well, you know, you, you know, well, truth is what you want it to be and what you feel. So the truth for Robert can be different from my truth, can be different from uh, Justin's truth. You know what I'm saying? How could all of us have three different truths? He says it's okay to cheat on his wife, all right? Uh, and I go, no, it's not okay. And Justin goes, hey, don't hurt nobody. I'm going to do it him. Who's right? None of us are right. God's right. God's, there has to be an absolute truth. That same party changed the truth. That you, whatever your truth is, it's okay. Oprah Winfrey, when they, you know, her speech at the Emmys or whatever it was recently, she goes, you know, your truth. There is no your truth. There's the truth. There's the truth. There's the truth. Now watch this. What has replacing the truth with relative truth is created confusion. Confusion about what? Your identity, your sexual identity, marriage, your gender. Now the whole world's confused about who they are and what they are. When almost 90% of every person, and this is a study done from the transgender community, the uh, LGBT, G, whatever community, when their own study that says 90% of people who've had a sex change have, after the change, attempted suicide. That is not the answer. This same movement has said that you're not responsible for your own actions. It's your mom's fault. It's your, and we get that it can be your mom's fault and everything has it. But here's the deal. What about abortion? What is abortion really about? It's about two things. One, it's about killing children. Okay, blood's blowing, the heart's beating. Okay, they feel pain. It's alive before it's born. So one, that allows us to kill babies. Number two, what it's, what it's about is, you know what? You got pregnant. You did what you shouldn't do. Now, you know what? We're going we're to get rid of your responsibility so you don't have it. So you have no responsibility. Just take this pill. Go see this doctor. You guys get what I'm saying? It has instilled a mindset in America. But here's the deal. <laughs> it's, they contributed to what has happened. I believe their policies have led us to this. But the problem is it's our fault. Because you would tell you why? Because the Christian community in America did not get versus Roe. That's right. Nothing. Nothing. We have nothing in the policies in government. We have 
Jonathan Kahn, the rabbi, saying we need to pray for America and, you know, put all that out there. The, the, he, without knowing it, he rallied the entire Christian community that, will, you know, if our people would, who would humble themselves and pray and then I would heal them. And if it wasn't for us rising up within ourselves, these times you can't turn things over to politicians who have agendas, who are bought, who are paid off, who are bigger crooks than we are. But anyway, here's the deal. What did the church really not do? And why is it our fault? It is even the government stuff. You ready? You know what we taught our children? You sit quietly and reverently in church service. And we tell them the little cutesy stories about the Bible. <laughs> but the whole time we're ignoring the world. All right? We're ignoring that there's real darkness out there, real evil, and there's a real devil. All right? We taught them to have faith, but we taught them that their faith was private. Just sit in your corner and have your faith. Faith is never private. Ever. Sorry. If you better believe that, you bought the lie. Jesus says, you are, you're ashamed of me? You want to you don't stand for me? I don't know you. What's private about faith? Nothing. In your testimony, your faith will save another person. That's what you're here for. God doesn't expect you to be on Billy Graham. He expects you to heal and to be changed and to be redeemed and then to share what God has done in your life. The rest of that's up to him. You don't got to be. But we didn't teach her. Our faith is private. Not only that, our faith is voiceless. Don't speak yet. church taught them that, not the people outside the church. Oh. You know those bracelets? Anybody got one on this morning before I get in trouble with the WWJD? I know that was a 90s, late 90s thing. <laughs> that was a year faster then. Okay. All right. You know the bracelet, right? WWJD? Yeah. Well, To see if I'm gonna do that campaign at our group at our church. No, you know what? You can wear the bracelet, but I ain't teaching it because it left out two thirds of the Bible. Because this Jesus was humble. This Jesus was loving no matter what. This Jesus would never stand for anything. He would just bow down. What? They didn't even know they were writing that because this was just a lusty, cutesy Jesus. They're not. And here's just a few things. Here's just a few of my thoughts. What would Jesus do, right? <laughs> But does that include the whole counsel of God? It did not. Right? The part when Jesus swore at Peter said, get behind me, Satan. Sometimes uh, y'all need to tell me that, Jeff, get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. You, you mean my Jesus swore at one of his own disciples? Uh -oh. <coughs> oh, wait a minute. There's, there's, there's some more Bible here. You know the part where Jesus cursed the fig tree and it wilted and died? And you know why he cursed the fig tree? Because it didn't produce fruit. Now let's connect the dots. He says the vine that doesn't produce fruit. Oh, but Jesus would never do that to you. John, would Jesus say he would love you no matter what you do wrong, no matter what you keep doing? No, he will love you. But he's also honest. Oh, don't know Jesus. Now, he doesn't throw you away. But there's a point that you've got to face your life. You've got to face your choices. You've got to face your actions. And you've got to make the God choice. We all do, don't you? Oh, here's... Here, here. Remember the part where Jesus turned over tables? Well, some do. Let's look at the whole story. The, uh, John is the one who tells the whole story. And this gets good. Uh, Shelby? Uh, no, 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 Leah. Would you read to me John 2, 13 to 17? I love this. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip. Time out. He didn't go get a whip. He made a whip. For the Christian leaders in the church, 
you gotta understand when they did they didn't come to the, uh, the, the altar and pray and you know and call out to Jesus and to save me, he'll be changed. But remember they took animals and they sacrificed them on the altar and the burnt offering and the blood offerings, you know. So they so the church leadership who were selling these things were cheating the people. Jesus wasn't fed up with churches and pastors and leaders. He just, I mean, he just didn't go get a whip. He made a whip. Jelly. Oh, I'm sorry, Leah. <laughs> and drove all from the temple courts. Time out. And how you drive somebody from the temple courts was a... You know what he was doing with that whip? He was whipping. <laughs> or at least he was whipping at him. Yeah. Wasn't the past, was it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that don't dare to. Well, but Jesus did. He would never stand for what's right. He would never face injustice. He would totally go and crucify me for no reason. I didn't want to be crucified. No, he, he hated injustice. He hated. He, he couldn't stand. That's why he died. To change the world. And, 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 and oh, I'm sorry. Did you finish reading that? Both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and everything. <laughs> First he swapped the table clean, then he turned the table over. So it was a double whammy. Okay. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus' love be deeper than any man has ever loved ever. He had compassion like like we will never understand. He gave his life, which most of us will never be asked to do. But at the same time, to bring glory to God, to honor God, to change the world, he had zeal. A godly zeal. So here's my question, church. What would Jesus do? Where is the godly zeal in Christians today against injustice and evil? That is a part of who God is. If somebody is abusing a child, raping a child, you dead gone right, I'll walk in there and I'll bust that house up. Mm -hmm. Where is the godly zeal? Fire, passion, the drive. We don't have it. Because we've been told that's not of God. That's not godly. It is God. But this has to be led by the Spirit. You just don't walk to somebody's church and just put on a show and an act. And... There is a time and place to stand for the things of God. In direct opposition to... By the way, Jesus was dealing with the church. He wasn't dealing with the government. He was dealing with the church. You know, it's really hard to be a pastor. And when I can tell a pastor manipulating people, playing that... Ex, uh, extra, Extrinsic. Yeah, to Intrinsic. manipulate people to make them feel they give and the. Man, I get so angry. Try and sin. This is in your anger. You're not sin. I didn't go kill him. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? That's what inspired me to, to do church because I was done with church. I've been burned as a pastor, I've been burned when I was sitting in the pew. And, I, and I, people got hurt when I did step out to create something special in you. And I said, The injustice. The children without home, without love, without food. The, the, the single mom that is beat down, the abused wife. The man who's doing it. Or the, the mother who's... Who is lost and broken, and she don't know why she's broken. She don't know why she's angry. She don't know why she's dysfunctional. When the whole church is playing the church game, but nobody is saving the world. But we'll go out and do something and pat ourselves on the back. I gave up six hours today. I sat in the corner and I made them pray a prayer, and they got saved. Hallelujah! You, did you know how you get somebody saved? You change. There's a thing of saved, but it says make disciples. You can't make disciples unless you make an investment, unless you build a relationship. It's more than say this prayer and walk away. But by the way, I'm glad you're going out and I'm glad you're handing out tracks. Don't you need to do that. But I really want us, this group, to run the the way you change the world is you got to let God heal your junk. That way you are equipped to heal somebody else's junk. Right. Pretty simple.
Those church people that Jesus heard of tables, they were hurting the people. <coughs> but Jesus' heart was for the people that were being, get it? They were being done wrong. So he, you're not going to do this, right? You're not going to hurt them. But his biggest reason is that you're not going to discredit my God, right. my husband. You're going to honor him. You're going to glorify him. Don't be I think we have. We weren't. We didn't teach them how to stand for the truth. We didn't teach our children to have the heart of God, the heart of Jesus. We didn't teach our children passion, fire, love for God and for mankind. We, we didn't instill in our children the fear of God. To keep going back to that sin, to keep going. You can parents didn't tell you you need to honor. You know, my mom, I don't know why, but my mom probably don't ever put anything on top of a bottle. And it's still to this day, because she taught, I heard, the only one thing she ever taught me about God is that, okay? You do not disrespect the Bible. I still to this day can't put anything on top of that Bible. It's just a book. The Word of God is in it, okay? It's just a book! But she taught me fear of God. Respect and honor for God. Well, we haven't done that. That's why we can, we, we, can, we can pray, we can do the sermon, we can play on the worship team, and then go home and sing. Go home and hate our husband. Go home and abuse our children. Go home and get on the internet. Go home and be free from um, You know what we did this on our children? And all of God. If you haven't showed your children how to fall down on your face for God and honor God, if you haven't taught your children that, shame on you. <laughs> shame on me, John. We teach you to be real. <laughs> and the last thing is we didn't steal in our children the principle of cause and effect. Now, what should we call cause and effect? You know, you get that verse I put up earlier, you know, you reap what you sow. Hmm. 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 The deadly form of cause and effect. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. If somebody doesn't do something in the church or in a person's life or in a family or in society, the cause and effect is, is that that culture, that church, that family, that child is going to die. Yep. Okay? Hey, John, in 1 John 4, 1 through 3, basically what it says is you better test every spirit. Yeah, I can't with it, Carlisle. We were bringing her kids to church. The parents didn't know me. They didn't kid was. They didn't care what their kid was. They got in the van. They drove for hours. Goes, but they got all the kids home. It was 10.30 at night. On a school night. Sometimes it was later than that. But some of the kids wanted to ride last. Parents didn't care. I'm going back to what the teacher said earlier. Parents did not know, did not care. Test the spirits. Because if the spirit of the Antichrist is in the world. False prophets, false preachers, false teachers. You guys get one of this? There is an evil out there. There's an evil out there. But remember I said everything we're facing today is nothing new? Yeah. Where did I get that from? Ecclesiastes 11. <laughs> Cause effect. Where are you? Ship your grain across the sea. After many days you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures. Yes, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If clouds are full of water, it will pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. Whoever watches the wind will not plan. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. Cause and effect. If you work hard, you deal it, you send it off the market, you will get a reward. Cause, effect. Okay? Uh, you get in these ventures, two of them might not work, but the other five will work. Huh? Do good. Sow something. You reap what you sow. But down here it goes, whoever watches the wind, hey, it's a windy day. Can't work today. Can't go pray today. Can't go witness today. Ain't got to be a counselor or a friend today. It's raining. You know, I had a long time last night. But we expect to change the world. We expect Jesus to come. You know those, teens, those kids in your class? You know, they're in a bad family. Come to church. Oh, this kid in my class and these kids in my class. Oh, poor, pitiful kids. Are you paying for them? Are you loving them? Just watching the wind blow. 
And so whoever looks at the clouds will not... You, you, you got them. Yeah, okay. Finish this. Right. As you do not know the wind or how the body is formed in the mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Even though that evil, God says, do the right thing, pray, get involved, make an investment, change the world, believe it, live it, because there is a cause and effect. Because God, you think that God ain't in it. You think you're not making a difference. It is. God is doing stuff you can't see. Trust Him. Because when we do something for God, we truly are. Well, you got to let God do what you can't do. You know what you can't do? Change a person. Heal a person. You know they're working with you while you're doing that? The Spirit. Do you know why you got to be in the Spirit, not in the flesh? Because you'll show it. You'll say the wrong thing. People will say the people say all the right things and they don't realize they're saying the wrong thing because in that moment they can't hear it, they can't understand it, they can't process it, and all you do is hide on top of the hurt, the guilt, the shame of saying all oh, the right things because you're not in the spirit to understand how to work with the spirit to change that situation. Stop thinking you know what's going on, Jeff. Stop thinking you know where God's going. Stop thinking this is just like you're alive. You got to connect with the spirit and follow the spirit. That's what I'm trying to teach us. So you in the morning. In the morning. And at evening, let your hands not be idle. For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. What God is saying, do what you're supposed to do. Do it with the spirit. Do it with the heart. And leave the result to me. I'm not responsible for whether that person gets saved. I'm responsible that I go and I sow and I... Because the Bible says you reap what you sow. But when you're young, like we got a lot of young people here, God addresses that. Uh, Jelly. Light is sweet and it Ooh. pleases the eye to see the sun. Oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? <clears throat> However, many years anyone may live, let them enjoy them all. Oh, yeah, enjoy life! Yeah! But let them remember the days of darkness. Oh, yeah. For there will be many. There will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. Hmm. You were in And you were young. Be happy while you were young. Be happy, Jim. You're still young compared to me. <laughs> let your heart give you joy in the days of your life. Oh, yeah. Have that fun. Enjoy it, baby. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever you Yeah. Yeah. How do you pat follow your heart? You can't go wrong. That's what God tells a girl to get what he wants. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. <laughs> See, go and have your fun. Because there's a cause and effect to your fun. And you're dishonoring God and you're rebellion against God and you're throwing yourself away and not honoring yourself, not respecting yourself, not honoring God, not... Oh, go ahead and have your fun, but just know that there's a line. There is a line, church. That one day I just want to come. You have the wrong man in your house, they'll rape your child. You don't invest in your kid. You don't love your daughter when she runs other men and she's dysfunctional. It's because you didn't love her. There is cause. That keep reading. Then banish anxiety from your heart hey. and cast off the troubles of your body, for youth and vigor are meaningless. And verse 10 is my favorite of all that because it says live differently. Banish. Get rid of the anxiety. Get rid of the fear. Get rid of the... Banish it. Don't let it become a part of who you are. Don't doubt who God is. Don't doubt who you are in God. Don't let people change your mind. Don't let the past destroy you. Banish it. Banish it. That's the choice that you and I make. You just ain't going to pray a prayer and it's going to go away. you got to stand in it. In the spirit of God, in the truth of God, you banish it. That is not who I am. I am a child of God. I am not what you're telling me. I am not what my ex-husband told me. I am not what my mother said to me. I had to tell myself, you banish it, you cast it off, <laughs> and you realize that, the, and here's the deal, the cause and effect will affect us, but, will it, but more long, it affects everyone. So here's the deal. What are, we, what are we going to do about it? What choices are we going to make? And what actions will we take? As a church, we've made a choice to be different, right? 
So many of you have made a choice to heal, to change, and to find answers. But here's the deal. Jeremiah 23, 29. This is who you are, Christian. I can't keep telling you who you are without you one day realizing this is who I am. This is why I am. This is what I have. It says, it's not my word like fire, declares the Lord. In the Spirit of God, you can walk up to a drug addict and say, Jesus loves you. You guys have been playing for your life. And you don't need to live this way. And that person will walk away from drugs that moment and never walk back. You have that feeling with the Spirit of God. Because not only is his word fire, his word is like a hammer that breaks a rock. I can't get through that hard-headed kid of mine, that hard-headed brother of mine. Jesus can't. Hmm. If you, it is the power of God and the Spirit of God to change the world. That's where I'm going. Now, I really like the title of today's sermon, I Hate My Brother. I've been trying to tell everyone that if you see, if you see a group, an organization, or a person, school, whatever, and there's hate in their heart, Jeff, read it for me, buddy. First John 3, 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's figured out. And they're hating people, and they're causing you to hate, dividing, causing you to divide your family, divide you and your, divide society. If, if, if this hate is crazy, it's okay to kill, it's okay to, to riot, it's okay to violence. And there is no eternal life in them. What is, what is the Bible telling us? That's not Jesus said. That isn't coming from God. That is not of God. That is not of God. And the second verse I got here. Is Luke 645, a good man, a godly man, brings good things out of the good story in his heart. And an evil man brings evil out of the evil story in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Okay. Where am I going with this? I'm almost done. You and I have the answer. You know what the answer is? Read that for me. One of these days, some simple soul will pick up the book of God <coughs> and believe it. Then the rest of us will be a mess. When the world sees a Christian love their enemies, forgive the person that has destroyed them, then they're bold. But if all of them like the world hate and be angry and violent and, and yell, cuss and fuck. But in the spirit, you can't even recover from that. By the way, you can't even recover from the thing you did wrong to other people because you won't forgive yourself. That's something you don't do. And where am I going with this? The answer to stop the violence. Now, this one started. We're talking about that school situation, right? I got the answer. I think we got the answer. It's what I've done my whole life. And it's what we're about to do as a church right now. The answer is simple. You gotta have a youth group that has a special part and focus. Just like you have to have a church that has a special part and focus. Now, with the youth group, I've been looking for a, a leader that God has put his finger on, that God has anointed, that God has healed, that God has changed, that they have something in them that's different. I'm looking for that somebody. Every group has that somebody. Every church has that something. Alright? And when you when God raises that person up, that's what I've been waiting on, and he has. As long as God tells them the same thing he told me. It's going to take a church that is going to live the vision and mission to change the world and invest and be the father, be the counselor, be the, the drama person, to, to heal, to invest. You see, you make kids believe that God can use it, God can change them. You have to make a church believe that God can use them. I preach every week. Who, who here is going to believe? Who here is going to believe God can use you? But we need the adult leaders and mentors. I have spent the time in church so far with us is to build leaders. I give you wisdom. I give us knowledge. I've tried to give us discernment. I've tried to, I've tried to show us a picture of how God works, how God works in our situations. Why? So we can do the world. And by the way, everything we do has to, everything I preach is about mental health. Do you know that? It's about the spirit of God. It's about mental health. Why do you think the way you think? Why do you act the way you act? Why do you respond to God the way you do? Why do you go? Why do you self-destruct your life? And what can you, and how do you get out of it? Because everybody walks in this door, that 85%, they're all right there. Now you know how to show them their life. <coughs> now you know how to help them understand 
their life. I've been equipping us to be leaders the entire time. The truth and the spirit. Uh, the landing, that's for therapy for, for young people. Teenagers. Shelly's working. Some of y'all don't know Shelly's working on a single mom's group. We gotta help the moms out. The single parents. Number two, number three, empower. We got real people with real emotional and demonic issues in their life, and it's gotta go deep. We gotta offer free counseling because the 85% can't pay. God that's on you. How do we pay people to do this? How do we get that? And, and you know what? The number one thing that, uh, oh, here's the other thing, uh, like Leah, the drama dancing. Giving them pride, giving them, giving them that they see that they're worth something. She's loving them, she's mentoring them, she's teaching them, and with the help, and you understand, this is, this is deeper than just doing a drama or going to church. This is changing the world. But the number one thing that we can all do, the part of those ministries is love. Real love. Because what I was about to say, real love covers multitude of things. I did not have a counselor. I did not have all this. But love. Jerry's mom and a few people love me. And that love covered the evil of my mom and my father. And I'm here today for counseling. Now, that being said, we can't go undo what just happened <coughs> in Florida. But what we can do is we can prevent it from happening here. And we're committed to building these ministries and doing this. And, and, and God brings the pieces. We're going to change the mind, the heart of our schools, of our families, and hopefully of our nation. And we're going to teach other churches how to build a ministry. Because Lord forbid that a kid steps up here and wants to talk about Forrest. Well, uh, Forrest does great lessons, but you know, Forrest, you don't love me. You don't know me. Or somebody comes here and Jeff, you don't care about me. You don't talk to me. You never try to reach out to me. And that women's leader, Shelly, and she's a hypocrite. She says one thing, doesn't know. And, oh, by the way, I can't call for prayer because nobody will actually come out and pray for me. Or I can't call Mary Ann because, you know, she's a. Uh, you know, she's all she does is sell me drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are a pharmacist, or whatever that thing's called. But anyway, yeah. You ready for this? The change has to begin in you before it begins through you. Healing, truth, freedom, and transformation is where God's got to take us, and it's where God's got to teach you to take other people. And the third thing is the song I'm going to here. I gotta tell you the greatest story. I'm doing this sermon. I thank God I don't know how to end this. There is a piece missing. I go to the gym about 11 o'clock last night. I got people blowing up my phone because they're mad at me because I'm talking to their husband, but not them. But I wasn't even talking to their husband in a situation that I talked to Leah by his day. All, all of a sudden, it's been laid out. Now I can deal with it the way I want to deal with it because everything's going crazy. Everybody fell off the face of the earth. Anthony Young and this one. And, hey, I meet this guy named James. James, this black guy comes in the store. He's probably 10 years older than me. He comes in and he, hey, I've never seen this guy in my life. I love him. <laughs> and the moment I heard his voice, I kicked him here. I like this So he said a couple things. We're going back and forth. And there's nobody in there. That's what there's nobody in there. He said something about God in church. I got to come in here. And my wife says, you need to get out of the house and get away from me or whatever it was he said. And, you know, I need to go work out the gym and, and walk. And so he comes to the gym. I've never seen him before. I'm there day and night. Some nights all night. I'm serious. I, I, that's been my schedule. I've never seen him before. So maybe I'm thinking, God, sometimes you send those angels and we're unaware. This man has a different something about him. So he said something about going to church. You know, I come here to work out. Y'all decided to go to church tomorrow morning. Hey, where are we going to church? Oh, uh, North First. You know, that big Baptist church over there. <laughs> he goes, me, you go to church. I told him to go to church. I said, yeah. He goes, good, good, good. Why'd you go to church? You know, whoa, whoa, whoa. He asked some questions. Why did God tell him some things about the Bible? Day? I didn't know what to think about. He said, they were giants. And they were half fallen angels and half men and, and all this stuff. Is that really in the Bible? I said, well, I'm a pastor. You're not a pastor. And so he starts saying, so I spell the next. I'm done. Oh, I'm dying. I normally give 20 minutes. I made it to an hour before I fell down. 
He goes, this conversation was not going to end until I was done. It was good. I love this man. I want to meet him. I have to speak. He's a good guy. He told me a story. A story. Got saved. And he went on this trip up to Boone, North Carolina, I guess, to run community. Not the part where all the, you know, all the tourists go, but the part where they're poor and they're hungry and stuff. And he said, I got there, and there was this uh, man. He goes, he was, he was black hair, tattoos all over him. And he's a respectable black man. I'm talking, you're a grandfather guy. And this man that he was talking about was rough and tough and angry and mean. And it's why he tried to walk and, you know, and she, you know, she look dressed a lot like an actor like him. <coughs> so he goes up to him and he said, the preacher said, go talk to him. <laughs> he goes, go talk to him. So he goes over and he talks to him. And I am not man. And you can tell he doesn't care about people. He goes, what do you want? He just pulls up his, he's in pedals, pulls up his, his, tell, his a tattoo of the rebel flag, right? James says, that was scary. I still love you. That man broke. That man broke. Here's a guy that hates black people. And black man just says, that is scary. I love you. That man came to Christ, his wife came to Christ. Power, authority. My word is fire. My word is a hammer. When you walk it, when you live in it, you will have that power. And God will use you on that level. But you got to want to be who God wants you to be enough to let him do that in your own life. There are some things that's got to get in the past and gone. There's things that's got to be healed. God's got to change you before he'll allow you to change the world. Yeah. Y'all want to meet James? I love this guy. We seems like I told Dan, I said, I just, I just met my, uh, I had a good friend in the Navy, and uh, his name was Wayne T. Baker. Yeah. And uh, Wayne T., and uh, he was a black guy, and we were best friends. <coughs> this is my new best friend. <laughs> uh, yeah. We'll put on the song. Uh, George will put on the song. Like...